Harvard Financial Wellness. Reach out to them for advice at 855-DON-GINO. And now back to your host, Don Getling and Gino Franti. Little help. They'll probably get a little help from dad. So tell us how most American families are breaking this down. Well, Gino, right now, your child, if, if they were ready to go to college, if they were an average American student, they're paying 11% of the bill. So I plan to shift that in a very different way. <laughs> I have no doubt, and, and your children are, are weeping inside right now, but... <laughs> 32% is coming from the parents' income and their savings. So okay, well, that's not 100%, bill, so okay. Now, the, there's a part that gets left out of this equation, which is, well, that came out of your pocket. Well, what's a loan? Does that come out of your pocket? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, this is for a whole nother show. We could do a whole nother show about student loans and how they affect your mortgage. Uh, so be careful if you're out there signing up for student loans for your children. Make sure you refinance your mortgage or your buy your house before the next quarters start because I keep seeing where we start an application for somebody and then the next quarter hits and all of a sudden the debt to income ratio changes. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, we'll do that another day. Well, 22 more percent is coming out of the pockets down the road from either student borrowing, which is about 16 percent, or parent borrowing, which is another 6 percent. So when we put all of those pieces together, you're looking at 65% of the cost of college is being foot by the parents and the student. That leaves 35%, 30 of which is coming from either the federal government, the state government, or the schools themselves, and about 5% comes from outside family or friends. So the question becomes, uh, the reality is, even of the 30% that's coming from grants and scholarship, that means my tax money is somewhere in that 30%. It could. Right. It could. If it's coming from the government, it is. Right. So at some point, that's the only place that I'm getting a, a subsidy going into college because the other 64% are coming from either directly from myself or my child. That's correct. Okay. So, uh, so that's where your tax dollars are going is into this 30% segment. And now what? So I would like for them to get as much of that as possible since I've already paid a ton of taxes. Darn right you do. You want to get as much bang for your buck as possible. Well, here's the catch. Um, this is a supply and demand game. And the better your students' curriculum and grades and test scores and essays and extracurricular activities, A, the more choice they're going to have. And the better those things are, the more likely a college or university is going to see that student as an asset worthy of fighting for, which means how much money is it going to take to get that child to say yes to my school and not someone else's 2,299 options. So it's my job as a parent to make sure my child has good grades, if not only so that they can get into a great school, but to subsidize their schooling. Exactly. You start to find that if your student is in the top 20 to 25 percent of a particular college's incoming class, that's where the likelihood that the money outside of need will come. So. I tell students this all the time. You've got a 3.5, 3.6 GPA. You've got a 17 or 1800 on the SAT. You're a relatively bright young person. You're not going to get into any of the top six UC schools. Wow. Uh, you're Very not. competitive. You're then. not going to get in. I don't even have to hesitate. You're not. You're not competitive. That same student could go to the University of New Mexico, which I, I pump on this show on a regular basis because I know how generous their financial aid system is. You're going to pay in-state tuition. That's $6,000 a year. That's no. half if you stayed here. Half the cost to leave is if you stayed in California. That's an, definitely an opposite dynamic of what we all think, right? Because typically we all think it costs more to go outside. So because of the subsidy programs that the other schools are trying to attract children to, then it's actually cheaper to go out. That's and exactly you get to right. ship your kids off and you get a little peace and quiet. There you go. And, <laughs> that sounds and like a win-win like, for me. And it's not like New Mexico is an expensive place to live either. So all the costs actually come down, not just the cost of buying the school, but everything living within that area is going to be cheaper than living here in California. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Rob. So now tell me, if I want to get the biggest piece of this pie and my child's not a superstar and we have to do this based solely on my financials, then what am I up against? Now you're looking at the same combination of you need to be a strong enough student to get in and you need to find schools that are going to meet as close to 100% of your demonstrated need as possible. Translate that into English for us. It means you can look publicly, this is all public information, that the average student will receive X percent of their financial need as demonstrated in the FAFSA or the CSS profile 
met by that college or university. So a local example would be USC. USC is $67,000 this year. That is their <laughs> cost of attendance. But they also meet 100% of a student's demonstrated financial needs. So let's take a student who lives downtown, great grades, compelling story. Um, they have everything to offer USC. USC admits them, and it's a single parent family, single income, and the family makes $20,000 a year. They're going to pay pretty much every penny of that kid's education. There might be a small loan. There might be some work study, but pretty much everything else will be paid for by that university. So how do I do this? Well, and that's a great story, but there's, you know, obviously that's a very unique story. That's not everyone's story. So let's take the medium, and, you know, I love the middle class. Uh, let's take the middle class, and here in Los Angeles, that's probably uh, family's income somewhere between, and it's sad that this is the middle class here in Los Angeles County, but it's somewhere between, Sixty-five and a hundred thousand dollars joint income in a household. I would say. I would go even higher. I would, would you say. Go higher? Up, I yeah. would say between say sixty, sixty-five, and up to almost one hundred and forty thousand. Okay, so what do those families do to finance their kids' college? I wish I had better news on that front, Gino. Uh, there's something else I came across uh, in one of these articles that talked about what the federal government, the Department of Education, is doing to what they call asset protection allowance or APA. It's basically the amount of money that you can have in your regular savings account that is protected, that is meant to use for all of your normal expenses in life. And once you cross that number, then they start assessing how much money you can pay for college. Just the last year alone, that number dropped by almost 50%. Wow, so 50% of the assets that I thought were shielded are now exiled and must be used towards college? That's correct. Okay, now, so that's very, very important. God, I hate using this word because when I grew up, I wasn't very much of a planner, but here we are again. Uh, can I plan around that? Is there loopholes? Is there, or is, or is that door closed or is that door just closing and there's still ways around that? There isn't anything you can do about the APA. It's, it's controlled by the government and there are no loopholes through it. However, planning at least a year in advance so you can have some assets moved into categories that can still benefit you in ways that won't affect what your FAFSA looks like can still happen. And I know this isn't going to probably be accurate. And of course, you need to speak to a financial planner about this. But, you know, like maybe an IRA or maybe an annuity or somewhere where I could shield my assets where they won't be counted towards my FAFSA application so that my children can still get loans, so I could still get loans, and I don't have to use the liquid assets that I've accumulated. Those are two very good examples. There are others, but those both work. Okay. And what about a 529? I know we don't have a lot of time left, but that's like, you know, you walk into Wells Fargo, they offer you a 529. I'm like, I don't even have kids. <laughs> sure. A, a 529 plan is, is both great and not so wonderful. And the short version is a 529 plan allows you to have a shielded asset from taxes as it accumulates over time. And when the money comes out for any qualified expense for a, a college, a post uh, high school education, it's going to come out tax free, which is great. Okay. Here's the negative. It has a big neon sign above it that colleges say, take me first, take me first. So, oh, you save $40,000 in your 529 plan. Before the colleges are going to give you any money, they're going to exhaust the money that you've earmarked for college. Wow. And I'm sure it's a use it or lose it situation, and I'm sure we need to get more information on that from our financial planner. Rob, we're running out of time here. I really appreciate you spending time with me today talking about how to finance college. I continue to think I'm going to force my kids to do a good job, figure out a way to get coverage themselves, and uh, I'm not going to earmark anything for them up front. They're going to have to work hard for it. I'm not going to argue your plan. Uh, I, I simply agree that having kids who are dedicated and love school and are, are fired up about continuing their learning, that's going to be the easiest sell to any college in America. Well, if you need more information, Rob, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, you can either call or email me. Call me. It rings in my pocket. It's area code 818-359-3779. I offer free consultations pretty much anywhere in Southern California. Uh, if email is your preferred, it's rob, R-O-B, at premiercollegeguide.com. Well, thank you for hanging out with Don Getling. is not here today, so it's just Gino Franti, Rob Schwartz, and earlier Taylor Weiner. I hope you got a great Saturday. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, and get out there and find a home and be a good human. Thanks for joining us today.